You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not shy. I can't do with Neil Diamond like that. I'm sorry. I... You guys are pitiful. That was Neil Diamond. It was just me singing. Oh, I have a cold. Is that how you sound? I had no idea. Sorry. This is Neil Diamond. You better. Oh, okay. <laughs> I do have a cold, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what that was that came out of me. I used to be able to do impressions. They weren't good, but at least you could tell who they were. Yeah. You're listening to a very special episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Now it's just I tried the to, same old rasp. Yeah, I tried to do Jerry Seinfeld the other day. And my cousin was like, what? Is, who is that? And I was like, oh, geez. Jerry Seinfeld used to be the easiest one. <laughs> You'd go, no, fuck! And your cousin was just like, who, was that Ellen DeGeneres? I don't know. What? <laughs> no, it's I know. Oh, come on. No, it's... Santa Claus is coming to town. See, I, it was supposed to be the Springsteen version. Oh, the Springsteen version. Oh, my gosh. Is that the worst? Cri- uh, that Okay, if we, when we do this show, that makes my list as number one. <laughs> That is barely counts as a song. Like seriously, you think you have a cold that day? I don't know what the heck happened to Springsteen. Maybe he's had a cold his whole life. I've never been a fan of the guy, but does that song suck? Hey, but we're not here to talk about Christmas songs. We're here to talk about you, me. Well, okay, the I'm listener. Glad. Oh, hi, listener. This is Rish Outfield. <laughs> That's right. Welcome. I'm Big Anklevich, and here we are with another episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And this is a special audience participation episode. How's yeah. That? Yeah. Everybody who participated, you can go down to the store and get yourself one of those participation trophies when we're done. Because you earned it. As long as you pay for it yourself. Yes. That's the way those work. <laughs> <laughs> you get it with your fees for uh, joining the league. I saw you with the box. What was in the box? So very, very briefly... Dear Deliciousness, <laughs> would, very briefly, if you wouldn't mind letting people know what the premise was for this particular episode, and then uh, I guess we'll get started, because, wow, we got, this is going to be a show. Yeah, we got uh, many entries, so we're going to jump right in. Our premise, well, first of all, we asked everybody to, I mean, they could make it as long or short as they wanted to. It could be a log line all the way up to a... I don't know, I guess a short story or something uh, based on this premise. And the premise was, No one knew who the present was from. There was no name on the box. (laughs) I have to find that scary music again. Thanks a lot. (laughs) So yeah, that was the premise that we put forth. And then whoever wanted to, Whoever had a take on that idea could send it to us. But Whoever the fun thing. What? Whoever had a hankering to get on the Dune, Steve. Let's see if I can find some banjo music for this part. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the thing that, that made this different from the other broken mirror type projects we've had on the show is you had the idea that they had to do this in their own voice. Right. So they had to record something and send it our way. So it's suddenly there's multiple people participating instead of just you and me. Yeah. Very fun, very cool, and I'm excited to hear what we've got. So the first participant that got us their uh, entry was Michael Gray. T. Michael Gray. Hot. (laughs) Yes. Hey, I'm coming, I'm coming. Jen closed her laptop and stood, stretching out her arms and fighting back a yawn when the doorbell rang a third time. She gave up with battle with the yawn and padded in stocking feet to the hall and to the front door. Frosted glass glowed white, showing no one on the other side. Jen missed this as she unlatched the security chain and twisted the lock. A bit early for carolers, she began. There was no one there. The world stared at her from under a thick quilt of snow, muffling any sounds and hinting at no movements other than a few stardy snowflakes and her breath as it streamed up to be lost in the eaves. She blinked, looked left, then right, and then down. A tree, stick thin and bare, protruded from the drift of her door. It was barely more than a large twig, only big enough to hold the bird stuck to it by a single nail through the neck. 
Jesus! She kicked at it, snapping the sapling in half and dropping the dead bird onto the snow where it lay next to two scarlet drips. She slammed the door, sending a short-lived chill wind down the hall and dislodging snow from somewhere on the roof to fall with a cushion soft thump. Jem rubbed her hand over her face and laughed. Kids, she thought. She went back to her laptop, but memories of the childhood intruded on the feature and she wrote. She sat back and allowed her mind to wander for a few minutes. Visions of Jem and her sisters ran through her head along with all the mischief they could up to across the streets of Mary Warren. She smiled, shook her head and turned back to her words on the screen. The memories vanished before she realised dead animals were never involved with any of her pranks. The following morning, the stick and the bird had been forgotten. Nothing more than a yuletime prank pulled by children already missing playing with fireworks. It was the last thing on her mind when the doorbell rang and she opened the door. Hello? As she looked out to the empty garden, the memories of the previous morning flooded back and she looked down. The bird and stick were still there, forlorn in the snow. Next to them were two pigeons in a line, their necks bent at odd angles. This was getting sick. Jen went to slam the door and then stopped. The poor animals couldn't be just left there, and she spent the next 15 minutes in a thick coat and gardening gloves, moving the tiny bodies to the compost heap. The next morning, the birds were not forgotten. She awoke early, looking from behind her curtains to the garden at random and never getting comfortable in her chair. Always listening for the doorbell, fingers tapping furiously her laptop, if the little bastards were going to come and pull that little prank again. The doorbell rang, and she was at a dead run before the electronic chime reached its second note, and at the door before it finished. She wrenched the handle of the door and faced no one. The echoes of the bell still ringing through the house, for there was no one at her step, or at her garden. Nothing but three chickens, their heads sliced cleanly in place next to their owners, tilted upwards in the pink snow. Mum, it's sick, said Jen into her phone. She paced from sofa to the dining room table and back again, retracing her path for the eighth time. I know, dear, I know. Have you called the police? Her mother asked, voice crackling with distance. Jen laughed, but without mirth. And say what? Some little shits are playing tricks. She flicked the curtains and looked outside again, greeted by the same tranquil, empty village from view from the last time. You're right, dear, sorry. Look, boys never change, just ignore them. They'll get bored if they don't get a reaction. The doorbell rang. Once, twice, then three times. Jen stayed at her computer, hands clamped over her ears and concentrated on the work on the screen. Those little bastards wouldn't get the satisfaction today. Snow fell heavily the next morning and Jen found herself hoping it would keep whoever it was at home. But the bell rang and it was as if something snapped inside her. She'd felt like a prisoner in her own home for four days, exactly the reason she'd moved from the city. She marched through the door, twisting the handle, and pulled hard. Snow avalanched into the hallway, swallowing her feet and shins and making her jump back. Cold fingered up its way up her legs, missed and ignored. Her attention was on the pathway. Four coal black birds lay in a half moon arc, their necks each constricted by a single ring forced over their heads, with another ring placed in their centre. Jen retraced her steps around the living room. I'm telling you, Mum, it's gold. She held the ring up to her face where its polished surface reflected pinpricks from merry yellow light. Where are the rest? Her mum asked. Jen shifted the phone between her ear and shoulder, holding the ring closer. Still on the birds, she said. Well, don't throw them away. There might be evidence or something. I won't, Mum, I won't. It's just I'm a little... She stopped. What? It's I'm a little uncomfortable, you know. It's creepy out here on my own. Well, you would move out there. I know, I know, but I told you what my editor said. My work's improved no end since I moved. I couldn't concentrate in that hellhole I lived before. Police sirens always going off, too scared to walk to the shops. I thought I'd gotten away from that. I didn't expect all this wicker man stuff. It's probably nothing, dear. Just local children trying to scare the new girl. At least they're being festive, aren't they? If it's geese next, could you keep one for Christmas? Jennifer? Jennifer, are you still there? Jen spent the next morning in the town. She hated herself for doing it, ignoring an inner voice calling her a coward, but she couldn't face another one of those calls. So before the sun rose, she left the house, taking her laptop and spent the morning drinking tea and working in a cafe. The bustle of people and steamy atmosphere drove the last five days from her mind, and she worked as happily as she had done in the last week. She had quite forgotten why she was even worried in the first place as she neared home. 
The air was clear, the sky was a diamond blue, and the birds were... Large white birds had been splayed across her garden. Their bodies split, and what could only be their insides laid around them in a circle, staining the snow beneath. There were six of them. The following morning she sat quietly on the sofa. Work was out of the question. It hadn't even entered her mind that she should do any, so great was the weight of anticipation. She could only sit, waiting for the doorbell. When it came, she walked only to the door. Seven snow-white swans lay in a single heap on her doorstep. Snow powdered lightly like icing sugar across their beaks, and their feathers held stiff under a sheen of ice. She couldn't tell how they died. Her mother didn't answer the phone that night, or the next morning. She kept trying, at first every fifteen minutes, then ten, then three, and then desperately redialing as soon as each call ran out. As she pressed the phone to her ear, her eyes flickered between the clock and the front door. If today followed the same routine as the past seven, the bell would ring soon, and she was afraid as she knew what would be on the other side of the door. All right, uh, welcome back, everybody. So that was Michael Gray with... T. Michael Gray, hot. On the eighth day. T. Michael Gray Hot sent us this creepy little story. Yeah, he had some creepy little music there, and uh, he had a creepy accent. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was Brooklyn. I couldn't quite make it out. <laughs> it was, yeah. yeah, it was. It was. Might be Maine. I'm not yeah, sure. It, was, it definitely might be a Mainer. Eastern yeah. American accent there. But yeah, it was, while I, we were listening to it, I was thinking, oh, you know what would be glorious is if we could do like a collection of broken mirror stories and I could spend all the money. <laughs> yeah, that would be glorious. So that's all you thought of the whole time that the story was playing? Well, then I started thinking about money and what I might do if I had money. And yeah, by then the story was over and I had missed most of it. <laughs> I hear you. Money would be nice. Instead, all we got was a lot of dead birds. <laughs> And then it got to the eighth day. What kind of bird were we going to find dead on the porch today? Do you remember uh, I, I came up with a, a term for something when, when a, a movie ends right when you would want it to begin? <laughs> yeah, I believe that was the Ian syndrome, right? And yeah, I feel like maybe there was a little bit of Ian syndrome yeah, going on. You were here. feeling I, the Ian syndrome? Because I was just end. like, oh gosh, after the, the. Well, I thought it was after the geese. It started to become people, like pipers <laughs> piping and maids of milking and that. And I was like, ooh, what's going to happen when it gets to the people? And well, I guess that's left to your imagination. Yeah, yeah. That was the uh, thing she was trying to prevent there at the end. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. We've got to call the police. There's a madman around. That's right. Run him down. Underground to a dive bar. In a West End town. <sighs> So that was the first uh, submission. That and was, he, he had music and he had the, he put on this phony, very phony English accent <laughs> on there. So, you know, not everybody had to go all out like that, but I appreciate that he did. Yeah, yeah, that was very cool. So how, 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 how would you rate his sticking to our premise? Nobody knew who the presents were She definitely from. didn't know who the presents were from. There was no from. writing on the box. But there wasn't a box. But there was a present. Did he, did he cheat? <laughs> uh, well, he interpreted present differently than I did. I, I interpreted it as a box with a hole cut out of it uh, in front of uh, I, Justin I'm, Timberlake's crotch. A uh, box with a hole cut out of it on, on your lap at the movie theater <laughs> <laughs> with some popcorn in it <laughs> and some other surprise. But I think that that's the beauty of these broken mirror things. When we first did, uh, everyone in town is exactly the same. People interpreted it exactly the same in exactly different ways, which surprised me because in my mind, exactly the same could only mean one thing. You know, they were like identical twins kind of thing. Uh -huh. But clearly, that's not how other people responded when they heard it exactly the same. Right. Same with present. When I said present, I thought of a box, you know, a wrapped present like under the tree or, you know, wherever it might be on, yeah, Justin Timberlake. But <laughs> with a hole cut out, just on. yeah, something being left at somebody's doorstep uh, could be considered a present. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. When I was a kid, we did this killed birds, this 12 days of Christmas thing. No, we didn't kill birds, but we did deliver things to somebody's house. 
anonymously. anonymously um, as a you know kind of a nice thing to do for somebody at Christmas time. It was one of those things that my parents encouraged me to do, and I think even after you moved away and you were no longer under your parents' thumb, you continued it. But this time, out of revenge. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, it's interesting, you know, some of the stuff that he he mentioned here, you know, where where she's dashing to the door to find out who's doing this. That that works both ways. I mean, not only when you're strangling birds and leaving them on somebody's doorstep, but just when you're giving them something nice. Anonymous gifts that you're not expecting, I guess. I'm not sure. You know, like, obviously, when you do the angel tree or whatever and you get presents from somebody that you you know you went to the charity and they and they were doing that already and i assume people aren't consumed with this i must know who is doing <laughs> this kind of fervor but yeah the people that we did it to they were insanely trying to ca- you know at the very end we finally like revealed ourselves to them on the last day and yeah they were telling us stories like you know, the doorbell would ring and you would hear just thunder as the people were running down the stairs trying to get to the uh, door in time to catch us running away. And so. how did you manage not to be caught? You would uh, just set something down and start running as you push the button? Pretty much, yeah. One of those where your finger just barely glanced over the button. <laughs> You're like, shoot, did it ring? Did yeah. it not ring? Should I run? Should I push it again? Yeah, it was pretty much like that. You would have to really dash and we would come at different times. So that they couldn't be like, okay, every time it's 7 o'clock, I'm going to be standing right by the door waiting for them. Kind of a thing. You know, we did one time where we came really early before school. One time where, you know, we were doing it later and it was just kind of all over. And we did our best. And uh, sometimes, yeah, it felt like a action movie or something, you know, where it's just a chase scene and you're desperately trying not to be caught. It's pretty fun. I don't know how much people do it anymore, but it was a really common thing for some reason when I was a kid. I haven't seen it done much since I've become an adult. But maybe, I don't think there's 12 days left till Christmas, so it's probably too late to do it this year. But maybe next year we'll we'll try and actually plan and do something like that. Because it's, oh, it's so much fun. Thank you, (laughs) T. Michael Gray Halt. Yes, that's what I've heard about him too. Well, he's got that accent that makes everyone hotter. Yep. It was fake, though. I swear you, you told me that. Look like Steve Buscemi and have a girl <laughs> on each arm if you spoke that way. That's right. Not that Steve Buscemi doesn't already probably have a girl on each arm. I, you know, I that guy that played in Fargo? Wealthy. I think his name was Steve. I think Steve. his name is Steve. She likes me for me. Not because I'm rich like Pavarotti. Or because, or because I'm, I'm such, such a hottie. hottie. <sighs> okay. And uh, now we're going to move on to participant number two. Uh, Josh R. sent us a little something, something. The famous trombonist? No, no, the other one. Thanks, announcer man, for chiming in. He's not retired after all, it turns out. (laughs) Okay, Josh. Oh, Roseman. Still not the trombonist. Rose plus Oh, he's got a bio here for us. A bio? Yeah, I'm going to read it. Okay. Josh Roseman. Roseman. Still not the trombonist. His fiction has appeared here on the Doonstief as well as in Asimov's Escape Pod and Starship Sofa. His latest story, Memories of My Father, is a tale of time travel and the reasons we forget. Get it at the link in the show notes. And you can follow Josh on Twitter at Listener42. Or on his website, roseplusman.com. All right, so Josh has something for us, and uh, we will uh, play it now. You ready? I don't think you're ready for this jelly. Robin Howard felt her cheeks flush pink as she pulled aside the tissue paper. What was in the box could barely be classified as clothing. There was a little black lace, a little red silk, some snaps for fastening... And that was it. The blush deepened. Her ex-husband had never bought her anything like this, but her new boyfriend, fiancé, she reminded herself, glancing down at her left hand, lips tipping upward just slightly, was all about making her feel beautiful, or sexy, or some combination of the two. It was nice, especially after years of being married to Wes, who was just focused on losing weight. But Robin had married him while he was fat, so clearly she'd known what she was getting into. 
Wes just hadn't been able to accept that. Daniel, though. Daniel knew that he could stand to lose a few pounds, but he didn't obsess over it. Hell, come to think of it, Robin knew that her curves got curvier around the holidays. Daniel always said, it just makes you that much more gorgeous, and all her complaints would melt away. He was the first man she'd been with, other than Wes, who'd been too focused on himself, who hadn't disparaged her shape. Robin lifted the lingerie out of the box and held it up. She wasn't even really sure how to get into it, but she had an hour to figure it out. Then Daniel would be home, and she knew just how to thank him for the Christmas gift. Robin's apartment didn't have a fireplace, but it did have a laundry room, and that was where Wes waited. He heard Robin puttering around the apartment, and even snuck a glance at her when he thought it was safe. She was by far the most beautiful woman he'd ever known, and while he missed being married to her, for many reasons, one definitely was the jealous looks he got from other people whenever they'd gone anywhere together. But she'd left him, right when he'd needed her most, and that wound refused to heal. Now that he was the secret Santa, though, he had the opportunity to try something a little different. Instead of acceptance, he was going to try revenge. He'd heard about it, and about how it doesn't really work, but he just had to know. And if nothing else, I got to see her dress up, like she never did for me. Around six, Wes heard the front door open. Robin? In here? Her voice had come from the direction of the bedroom. A few seconds later, Daniel made it to the bedroom door. Oh, wow, he said. And even without looking, Wes knew Daniel was dumbstruck by Robin's appearance in the lingerie he'd pull out of the bag for her. You look, he cast about for words, you look so sexy. Wes's brow furrowed. Sexy was the best Daniel could come up with? What about stunning or gorgeous or amazing? Maybe Wes hadn't been the most attentive husband on the planet, but at least he'd found ways to compliment his wife. If sexy was the best Daniel could come up with, what kind of husband would he be? I love it, Robin said, and out of the corner of his ear, Wes heard the bed shift as she got up, presumably to go to Daniel and put her arms around him. Thank you, baby. That was the first shoe to drop, and the silence as it did was deafening. Satisfied that he'd destroyed his ex-wife's relationship, Wes concentrated on the hotel where he was staying, barely one step ahead of the elf hit squad that was on his tail, and disappeared. That night, Wes visited Robin's apartment again. The magic of Christmas ensured that she'd be asleep, which was good, because when Wes saw Robin cuddled up against Daniel, he shouted loudly enough to wake the entire building. It hadn't worked. They were still together. Wes couldn't fathom how. He'd left the present on Robin's bed, no name on the box, and as he'd planned, she'd assumed it was from her fiancé. Then when she'd thanked him for it, the fiancé was supposed to think she'd gotten it from some other lover and was cheating on him. It worked on every TV show he'd ever watched. It should have worked here, too. Furious. Frustrated, Wes went back to the laundry room and disappeared. Robin woke before Daniel, she always did, and went out into the living room, snagging the lingerie around the way. She examined the Christmas tree. She could have sworn there were a few presents that hadn't been there last night, but maybe Daniel had gotten up and put something out for her. Robin did the same, taking two boxes out from the back of the pantry, behind the paper towels, and setting them among the other gifts. Then she climbed into the outfit snapped all the snaps, adjusted it as best she could, and went back into the bedroom. She wasn't cheating on Daniel. She'd never cheated on anyone, and they had a long talk about the lingerie. They'd decided it was a Christmas gift gone wrong. After all, on Christmas Eve there was plenty of magic afoot, what with Santa Claus and everything, and maybe some wires had gotten crossed somewhere. They both knew Santa Claus was real. As children, they'd both caught glimpses of him coming down the chimneys and leaving presents under the tree. Anyway, the lingerie fit perfectly. No need to let it go to waste. Not last night, and not this morning. Wes appeared in the laundry room, heard the sounds coming from the open bedroom door, and disappeared again. Oh well, there was always next year. All right, Josh Roseman back with Secret Santa Part 3. We had no idea. It took us a second as we heard... Wait, Wes? And he he was obsessed about losing... Wait, isn't that the name? And then, yes, it was confirmed. Secret Santa Part 3. Well, I, I, this can't quite be Secret Santa Part 3. It's like Secret Santa 1 and 3 quarters. Well, it'd have one to be 2.1. 1 and, a, one. One and <laughs> a teeny tiny bit. Yeah, it was only 5 minutes, so it was a little less uh, epic. 
compared to the other two, which were much longer. But you know, at least the Secret Santa has not gone away, but he's turned evil. Oh, not man. evil. He's just trying to. He was trying to woman destroy back. his woman's relationship. He wasn't trying to get her back. That was unkind. And yet, at least it backfired on him. Santa can't do anything that turns out bad, right? Is that right? Is that why it didn't work? I don't know. That's part of his magic. He's nice. I looked over at you when they, they both knew Santa was real. Because you know, <laughs> that complies to that my That sentence wish. was in there for you. <laughs> and I don't know. Sh- should it have worked? Oh, should she her relationship have been destroyed? In real life, what would happen? Hey, it possibly could work. Well, you know you. You know whether you're the jealous type or not. You know whether you would buy it or not that it was not from some other man and all that stuff. I'm, whether you'd take her word for it or... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it might work. It works on all the TV shows. Have you seen a TV show like that? Maybe that was just the naughty shows that I wasn't able to stay up and watch. I I haven't, but people break up for even for way stupider reasons than that on the on shows. <laughs> True, the, where the one party is trying to explain and the other one just you know won't hear it and starts to walk away, and the yeah, offended that, party the, the 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 wronged party just lets him walk away. Yeah, that happens so often in those romantic comedy type movies where you just like seriously, how can this be happening again in another you know. I know exactly what you're saying. So yeah, they they it should have worked. But hey, this is, you know, the holidays, all sorts of magic happens. Now, I I can't remember cuz it's been several years since we had our last Secret Santa, but wasn't wasn't Wes not a believer in Santa Claus in the first one and then, you know, had to become one because all of a sudden he was abducted by the elves and part of Santa's American Idol tryouts crew. I remember feeling bad for him because he just couldn't lose weight no matter what happened. And uh-huh. then later he found out it was all according to a, the Santa plan. A plan, but he, his, yeah, his whole life, including his marriage, could have failed for nothing if he hadn't been chosen. Which just didn't seem very fair. Yeah, I don't know. I wish I could remember if, uh, if you know, because, yeah, like you said, that that's always been one of my pet peeves about holiday stories for some reason they're always based on the belief or non-belief of children in santa i don't get it i don't understand like if it, it, you know it's just that santa's not something that there's no proof of you know what i mean it's right there if santa is real then presents came that didn't come from parents and parents can't be like, Santa's not real. And then kids be like, Santa's real. You know, if there is a Santa that's bringing presents every year, the parents are going to be like, oh, okay, so Santa brought presents. That must mean he's real. They can't be like, I brought those presents. <laughs> there is no Santa. I don't know. I, I can never figure out that whole, the, the world doesn't make any sense to me because of that. You know what I mean? It, it, it's got to be one way or the other. It can't be both. Unless, I guess, most shows that it's, once you stop believing, then Santa stops coming or something like that. I'm not sure exactly what the deal is. And it's every stinking movie. Every movie. So, like, if you show it to a kid who's young enough that they still believe, like, what does that do? Does that immediately, like, start planting the doubts in there where they're like, oh, every show that I watch is about whether Santa's real or not. Should I be wondering if Santa's real? (laughs) <laughs> I hate it, as you well know, and I'm sure all the listeners also know. I don't know. I think the whole Santa thing is a symbol for something else, yeah. whether it's faith or religion or belief in the inherent decency of people, which I, I think if you live long enough, you put away. <laughs> you realize, oh, hey, that's just buckets of reindeer <laughs> shit. <laughs> Okay. Maybe not. I don't know. We talked about it. You've never seen in a movie where the parents believe in Santa. Yeah. Ever. Never. There's no such thing. Exactly. And so to have Josh's do that, I felt like, well, that has to be 
directly an answer to you. you like, think so? I'm going to give him his fondest wish on yes! Christmas. I didn't have to do it for myself like we did. I think, was that last year's Christmas story or the year before when I did that? Oh, yeah. Last year was mine with the Ouija board. This The year before was the one with Santa with like a crowbar. <laughs> Yeah, that's where I made the guy already believe in Santa, and then Santa shows up and he's like, what? You're not supposed to come here at this time, you're supposed to wait. But finally, somebody other than myself wrote a world like that. Yes! I am validated. Well, uh, okay, thanks for listening, up, everybody. Never gonna happen again. Uh show's now over. This is actually going to be our last show now, because now that I'm validated, I don't need to keep going. You can keep going if you want, Rish. I'll, um, I'm done. Okay, well, I, I guess I'll do the rest of the episode by myself. I think uh, we'll look at our next uh, participant. Oh, I'm supposed to say it? Well, you were... Looking for- All right, kiddies. We've got a creepy little tale by Nathan Algrim. <laughs> and it's titled Spiders, All of Them. No, it's not. Wait, what? what? I, I need you. What? I told you Spiders, All of Them is an old submission that... This is Nathan Algram, and it's called Holiday Episode Broken Mirror Story. Uh, so, so this one is called uh, <laughs> Show. This one is called Christmas Shadows by Nathan Algram. Enjoy. Oh, the Crypt Keeper just morphed right into Casey Kasem. That was interesting. Okay. Christmas Shadows by Nathan Algram. I dreaded setting the alarm for Christmas, but I knew I had to. I also knew that it would be my job the following morning to get everyone moving, since every scrap of sadness seemed to hit Sarah and Mom harder than it ever hit me. So I flipped my bedroom alarm to go off at nine, making sure to keep it on buzz. Christmas carols would just be too much. Our house was comfortably quiet, and blessedly dark. Our decision to go without a Christmas tree helped keep the persistent reminders of the holidays at arm's length. After a surprisingly dreamless sleep, a buzz jolted me awake. I smacked off the alarm while uncurling from the covers and sat up before the dread of the day to come hit me again. Even so, I knew we'd never make it through without some semblance of normalcy, so I shuffled to Mom's door. Mom? I whispered after kneeling down beside her bed. Mom, let's get up. I can make you some breakfast if you want. Hmm? She tried to sound like I just woke her, but I could tell she had just been staring at the wall since I came in. But why don't I make you two your waffles? Like, well... She trailed off, tears once again catching in her throat. I know, Mom. I thought it might be better to stay away from those things this year. I tried to keep my voice easy, but I could feel my face betraying how nervous I was. If she snapped today, I wasn't sure if I could make it either. Okay, go get Sarah. She started working her way out of bed. I'll be down in a minute. Sarah was no easier, but at least I didn't have to deal with tears. I quickly shifted gears to my Sarah strategy. All right, Sarah, I said, pushing the door open. Mom's up and we need you downstairs in ten. She met me with her usual blank stare and a sigh. Why do you insist on all of this crap? I know it's Christmas, but that's the point. I can't do this. I can fake it through any other day for Mom, but I can't do Christmas. I crossed the room in a few steps, grabbing her by the arm. I don't care who you do it for, but you need to live through today like the rest of us. No gifts, no traditions, but we need to make it through. She didn't fight back as I pulled her to her feet. You know I hate this. It feels worse today. She wasn't cooperating, but when I saw she wouldn't fall back into bed, I headed out of her room. You say that like it's easy for me, I mumbled on my way out. For the first time this morning, I sped up as I went to the kitchen. As much as seeing the living room decked out in our traditional Christmas cheer would have hurt, I knew that seeing it bare of all decorations would have also pushed me over the edge. I almost jogged straight past the doorway until I made it to the safety of the kitchen. Mom hadn't made it down yet, although that didn't surprise me too much. 
I did my best to keep my mind blank as I prepped the outrageously large waffle maker and bisquick. Automatically, I reached for the seasonal stuff, almost putting in the cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves to turn the batter into my classic wintertime waffles. My hands froze, stopping me from making a scene. I went plain Jane, and the easy preparation helped to clear my mind, at least for a while. My piece was shaken as I ladled the batter into the hot iron. The black grid of the empty fourth waffle section glared up at me as the other three simmered with their warming batter. I wasn't really sure what happened the rest of the day. For once, Mom's passive-aggressive comments that I was acting on autopilot would have been accurate. Not that she was any different, of course. She wandered through the kitchen for her breakfast and promptly locked herself in her room. She only slowed down as she passed through the hallway to place her hand on Dad's picture, the last one that we had of him. The smiles of all of us in the picture on our final vacation as a whole family during the Ferris Bueller tour of Chicago seemed a lot farther away than the four months we had gone without him. Sarah wasn't much better. She just chose to mope at the kitchen table. I spent the day shoveling our half-mile driveway as an excuse to get away from the oppressive silence, even if it just meant wandering up and down the cracked pavement for a few hours. The dusting of snow made for as white a Christmas as we could hope for in Tennessee, but it didn't leave much work for me to do. I must have walked that path 20 times before the sun hit the horizon, and I begrudgingly stepped back inside. That time, I forgot to avoid the living room. My eyes swept past the mantel to the corner of the room where, on any other Christmas, Dad's prized tinsel tree would be shimmering in all of its glory. The emptiness didn't shock me, but the one squat package sitting where presents normally piled up made me freeze two steps in the door. Anger flared in me. After the weeks of being the one to have to drag the family through the motions, not that anyone stopped to ask how I was feeling, one of them had the nerve to do this. Unfreezing, I slammed the door and rushed into the house. Mom, what the hell is this? You promised we wouldn't do Christmas, and then... I couldn't continue. Rounding the island, I saw Mom and Sarah curled up in the opposite corner, as far away from the pristinely wrapped box as possible. They hadn't touched each other since Dad's funeral. They must have been terrified to get past that now. They both looked at me with tear-stained faces without any recognition of my accusation. Without saying anything, I knew neither of them had put the present there either. I didn't know how long I stood there next to them, the three of us staring across the room. My anger slowly faded to a hurt confusion as I realized that no one knew who the present was from. When we finally worked up the courage to approach it, we discovered that nothing was even written on the box. We're not going, Mom said, not taking her eyes off the opened package on the floor. We were still around the box that Mom had opened 30 minutes ago. She had tried to keep her face neutral through the whole thing, but I could see her pain as soon as she had picked it up. It was the wrapping. Dad had fallen in love with the Japanese-style Christmas wrapping, after seeing that new special about the store clerks wrapping presents in 30 seconds, and he had made it a staple on every Christmas since then. I could tell Mom wanted to throw the box into the attic with the rest of those painful memories, but she had resolutely torn the paper, leaving it in a pile in her lap. As she lifted the lid off, another of Dad's Christmas standards stared out at us. Inside the box, which had been large enough for the KitchenAid mixer Mom got last year, was just a slim envelope resting on a bed of glittered tissue paper. I heard Sarah start to moan a low, painful sound as she read over Mom's shoulder. It was Dad's characteristic scrawl, no matter how much I wanted to deny it. All it said was, One more time, Merry Christmas. Four tickets. That was how all of our family vacations had started, with Mom and Dad brandishing four tickets to Sarah and me with pride. There were still four tickets, but we couldn't even fill all the seats anymore. Mom, we have to go, I pleaded with her. I was shaken by Dad's gifts, Dad's handwriting, and every personal touch I hadn't seen in months, but I was terrified of what our family was becoming. Sarah had become a ghost, barely existing outside of her room. I didn't even want to think about how many classes she would have to retake the next year. 
If anything, Mom had become a poltergeist, as silent as Sarah, until any small remembrance set her off. Even Grandma's Corel dishes were chipped and shattered, and those had lasted through my own personal terrible twos. I don't know what kind of sick joke this is, but your father didn't do this, she said. I'm not going to waltz around New York on some god-awful vacation funeral. I could hear the hysteria about to break through. This mystery gift was more than a reminder of Dad. It was a spotlight on everything we missed about him. Whoever did this, they will not take me away from here. This is our house, and I will stay. But Mom, don't you think... You will never understand, and you never did. We built this house, and you just live here. This was our life. He's gone, and this is all I have left. I'm not leaving. I hadn't realized it until she said, but Mom actually hadn't set foot outside the house since the funeral. Between school and taking on every chore, it never surprised me to come home with Mom already there, but it made sense now. I had become the de facto head of the house, since I seemed to be the only functional one around. After a few days of seeing the pantry empty, I started doing everything from grocery shopping to getting Sarah from place to place. Mom really had become a recluse. That's the point, Mom, I said after some hesitation. I tried to gauge her reaction to know how far I could push. We need to start living again. You need to start living again. That was too much for her. Don't you dare preach to me. Well, you've been happy to just go about your life. I wake up every morning with him gone. I can't forget him that quick. Dad died, but it's like you did too. How the hell do you think I feel having both of you just drop off the face of the earth? I knew that was precisely the wrong thing to say, but even I had my breaking point, and apparently that was hers. With a glare normally reserved for when I totaled the car or cussed out Dad, Mom got up without another word and left. The gentle closing of her door scared me more than the slam I was expecting. Sarah looked at me with a tear-stained face. She looked like she was feeling all the pain that I had been hiding from. Curled up in the corner, Sarah was my last chance to remember Dad the right way. His way. We have to go. She whispered, staring at the envelope. Like he said, one more time. Sarah and I spent the whole of the 26th trying to break Mom out of her self-imposed exile. Neither of us had the heart to pick the lock on her door, but we pleaded with her in shifts. Nothing got her to change her mind. Nothing even got a response. As weird as it was, the flushing of the toilet always came as a relief because it was the only way we knew she was alive behind that door. The following morning, we each said our goodbyes to Mom and left a plate of Dad's famous waffles at her door. For the first time, Sarah and I worked together to make them, and each ingredient we added to the batter added a glimmer of light to our gloom. By the time we laid the plate on Mom's door, we were both resolutely neutral, in full understanding that cheer would be too much to ask. Mom... We have to head out now, I called through the door. Sarah and I will take tons of pictures for you. Yeah, we'll bring memories back, Sarah said, forehead resting on the door. She was a better description of melancholy than any image my English teacher had ever managed. I love you. We didn't hear anything in return. I assumed Sarah was as nervous as I was, since she didn't try to start any conversations during the entire trip there. It felt like I was going on the job interview of my life. Like my life was about to be fulfilled or ruined. Our Uber driver noticed our behavior, and I kind of felt bad for him. I think he saw our empty stairs as the beginning of some rampage that would end up on the evening news. The look of relief on his face after he dropped us off at the departures gate almost made me feel as guilty as if I had acted out his fears. The plane ride was worse with the two empty seats as a part of our travel party. By an unspoken agreement, Sarah and I assumed our traditional positions for our family plane rides. We took the aisles, her with her right leg free, and me with my left, leaving the windows for Mom and Dad. Mom's seat was quickly covered by Sarah's jacket, but I didn't have the heart to even lift the armrest up. 
I couldn't bring myself to encroach on Dad's space. Nevertheless, I caught myself staring at the dilapidated cushion throughout the flight. The seat was so worn that it looked like someone had just stood up from the seat, leaving their imprint on the cushion, about to return. That thought made it harder to keep my eyes dry, but I managed. We got off the plane in a daze. Never having been to LaGuardia, I didn't much know what to expect. But the only thing distinguishing this journey to the baggage claim from any other trip was the number of I Heart NYC t-shirts for sale. Where exactly do we go from here? Sarah asked, pulling me out of my reverie. Well, that was a good question. All Dad had given us was a set of tickets. I guess we had all been too overwhelmed to think about much else. The lack of anyone old enough to buy alcohol probably hadn't helped either. I mean, it's great just to be in the city and all, but I've never even wanted to come here except to try the Chicago thing again. I knew what she meant. That Ferris Bueller trip had been powerful enough to bring our family closer, even with Sarah in middle school and me wavering between rebellion and passive disdain for mom and dad. When we had come back home, Sarah and I knew our next choice on our list, the Elf Tour. The hope of walking where Buddy walked and smashing all the elevator buttons on the Empire State Building kept Christmas on our minds from July onwards. I just had never thought that it would happen after the accident took Dad before we could even spend another Christmas together. Do we have money, you know, to stay anywhere? The sass reminded me of pre-accident Sarah. It'll be a long two days sleeping in the airport. I think I found our answer, I said, trying to mask the relief with some older brother sass of my own. For the first time in my life, I had a chauffeur. Name on a sign and everything. A petite woman dressed in full elf costume did not exactly fit my picture of a personal driver, but it definitely seemed like something Dad would do. The elf costume was even complimented by a pixie haircut. On top of that, she did seem weirdly familiar. Jake? Sarah? She said cheerfully. I'll be your guide for this tour. I'm Megan. I had never been treated like a VIP before. She had our bags at her feet, and putting her sign away, picked them up to take us to our car. Seeing someone half my size carry both of our suitcases made me feel kind of like a slob, but she didn't seem to mind. I'm sorry, but you look really familiar, I said as we made our way to the parking deck. I can't figure out... I was an elf, she said over her shoulder. It sounded like one of those stories she had been forced to tell one too many times. It gets me recognized a lot, but not much work. I didn't even believe this job was real when my agent sent it to me. An elf? In elf? I said excited. Like, elf elf? Buddy elf? No way. Sarah looked incredulous. That's too much, even for dad. All I know is the job said that I needed to drive you guys around for two days and give you the elf tour. Which, of course, doesn't exist. But I guess that's why he hired me. She stopped in her tracks. Wait, where's your mom? The job said there would be three of you. Sarah looked at me, eyes wide. I guessed it would be up to me to explain. She, uh, couldn't make it. She wasn't feeling well. Which was true in a way, so I felt okay leaving it at that. That's okay, Megan said reassuringly. Her people-pleaser actor training seemed to be kicking in. For the next two days, I will personally make sure you get the full elf experience. And she did. It turns out there aren't actually that many buttons on the Empire State Building's elevators, but Sarah and I geeked out by pretending to light up some imaginary buttons on the wall. I could tell that Megan had been coached on this trip. She took us on the Insider's Tour. She stopped at 23rd and Broadway and set a stick of gum on the subway station railing for us to chew off. When we pulled up to Fifth Avenue, she double parked and stopped traffic. That was when I learned that all the stereotypes of New Yorker road rage are apparently true. Even as she got pretty close to being hit by a number of taxis, we actually smiled and laughed as we hopped the crosswalk lines like Buddy. As we walked up to Rockefeller Center on our second night, I finally had enough time to take in the experience. Throughout the whole thing, Sarah had never cried. She had never withdrawn, and neither had I. 
On the flight here, I was terrified that images of our imagined family vacation would be too painful, but it had been just the opposite. The whole time it felt like we were a family again, even if it was just the two of us. All the worry and anger I had, having been the one to keep the house running for months, had worn away with each stop on our tour. Now, standing in the crowd, waiting for the Rockettes to high-kick their way under the iconic Christmas tree, I was actually looking forward to waking up the next morning. Megan had one final surprise for us as she dropped us off at LaGuardia the next morning. I figured you would want to remember this, so here you go. I know it's old-fashioned, but... She extended her hand with a package of drugstore photo prints, just like we always got back when each vacation had its dedicated, disposable film camera. I just wanted to say, she continued, that I never expected you two to have so much joy during this. Watching you two, it always seemed like you were doing this for more than yourselves. And, well, she looked sheepish, like she was saying too much. It's okay, I cut in. I didn't know how to handle any sudden emotion, even after this transformative trip. Now we can remember our final family vacation the way it should be. We said our goodbyes, and again, Sarah and I lapsed into silence as we checked our bags. You know, I almost cut you off earlier, Sarah said as she was tying up her shoes after the security check. But it's weird. This was totally a family thing, you know what I mean? I know. It was weird. It wasn't even just the stuff we did. Honestly, everywhere we went, I kept on seeing space right next to us. I went on to tell her everything. The combination of events told end-to-end -end illustrated their strangeness more than any one of them had by themselves. The depressed airline cushion, the fresh shoe prints laying out my path on that crosswalk, the gap between me and the crowd at Rockefeller Center, even when everyone else was completely packed together. I don't know what it means, but I felt him there. I looked at her vaguely defensive for the inevitable sass. Me too, she said, her agreement and sincerity completely catching me off guard. We walked to our gate in a surprisingly comfortable silence. As soon as we sat down, Sarah nodded off. Not that I could blame her after that long night under the tree. Waiting for boarding, I pulled out the packet of pictures Megan gave us. They really were a snapshot of our vacation, with a mix of candid and posed shots that we could never have gotten when the whole family was along for the ride. The first few pictures looked like the printer may have done a bad job. Then, I thought it was the light. I stopped my rapid slideshow to take a closer look at the discolorations that appeared in every picture. It was more than some systematic printer error. The discoloration moved places between the pictures. A smudge hovered in front of me on the crosswalk, one line ahead. To the right of me, in front of the Empire State Building, another shadow was etched at my shoulder. I tried to look for residue of some marker or crayon or anything that would implicate Megan in this. I couldn't see anything incriminating, just that shadow, always in front or to my right. Right where Dad always staged himself for any of our family photos. My hands began to shake as I flipped through the stack of photos faster, finding the shadow darting around, following my image in each one. That comforting, complete feeling that I had about our vacation was giving way to panic, but I kept the mom-like hysteria down by convincing myself that anything was possible with Photoshop. It took all of my self-control not to scream as I flipped to the final picture. The glossy 4x6 showed Sarah and me from behind with the Rockettes on stage and the Christmas tree looming in the corner. I had sealed myself for the inevitable shadow off to my side. It was the shadow hovering beside Sarah that sent my pulse racing. Try as I could, I could not talk to Sarah on the flight home. Oblivious to my fears, she had tried to reminisce across the aisle and eventually gave up after her stories were repeatedly met with my white-knuckled stare. I needed to get home before I could talk again. I practically ran inside, afraid of what I might find, but unable to stop myself. After fumbling with the keys, I burst inside, tripping over my shoes by the door. The house was completely dark, 
even in the kitchen, which normally had the range lights on overnight to enable Mom's late-night feedings. Mom, I called out with more confidence than I felt, flipping the hall lights on. We're back. You won't believe the trip we had. Sarah walked in a minute later, stomping off her boots in the doorway and taking off her coat before stopping to look at me. What's wrong with you? She trailed off as she took in my wide-eyed stare. As I looked helplessly at my sister, returning from the family vacation of a lifetime, the complete silence in the house overtook us both. All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, from that story. Uh, Nathan Algrim. Not so I, grim. I wouldn't say it was all grim, but he, <laughs> in his email, he says that this is his first story he's written since his high school creative writing class in 1919. 1990. Um, Holy, you know what? <laughs> That's close to 100 years ago, kids. <laughs> and he managed to refer to an Uber in his story, yeah. which I will never be able That's to do. That's pretty impressive. I'm never going to be young enough ever to write about an Uber. No, I have no idea when his class. It could have been like last year for all I know. I don't know when his high school I, writing sure class was. was. He actually has a picture of himself attached here, and he doesn't look like it was 1919. Are there any mysterious shadows in the picture? Um, hmm. There's some kind of blurry greenish things and whitish things in the background, so maybe. Wow. So, so in his author's note, he, he, I don't know that he apologized for the length of the story, but he did say, you know, it's real long, and I would understand if you didn't want to run it on the show. And I was never tempted to not run it on the show. Well, there was one moment when I was tempted to not run it, which will become clear later. Uh, good. Um, um, thanks for that little revelation. No, it's a tease. I don't know. Every tease that I've ever met, they don't ever pay off in the end. They just tease and tease, and then you just wind up with the famous trombonist. Uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, he, he was saying in his email that he sent us that, you know, listening to Rish and I talk about writing and, and all that kind of stuff that we talk about a lot of times on the show kind of inspired him to get back into writing to try his hand and so with this participation event <laughs> and a deadline uh, looming over his head it, it got him to do it judging from the way the story ended i think he probably was a little too inspired by other stories that he's heard from me in the past well i probably have to talk to him about the ending and the feeling you're supposed to get from the ending of the story, because it feels really uplifting. It feels pretty, you know, it's supernatural in a positive way, you know. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But then you get that last revelation. And my question is, how are we to, how are we supposed to take that last revelation? Like a kick in the nuts. So like a, a big Anklevich story. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said he got a little too inspired by us. Okay, well, I guess so. <laughs> Nathan, thank you for sharing that with us. I mean, that that was a story. That was a full, it was like 20-something minutes long. Yeah, yeah it, uh, it, it definitely, that was a lot of effort put into this, so that was pretty cool. No one knew who the present came from. No name was written <laughs> on the box. <laughs> I liked how he almost used it word for word in there. He Justice. gets bonus points for yeah, that. Yeah, he gets boner points for that. I mean, wait, wait, bo what? bonus, sorry. All Grimm. Al W. Grimm. <laughs> Is he the phantom dumper? <laughs> yes. There's some... Honey, what, some... What's that sound out in the yard? <laughs> <laughs> Honey, there's a strange man. He... Oh, he's squatting. Oh, no. Call the police. The dumper has returned. <laughs> There's some story going on in the news here about a guy who's the phantom dumper. Apparently, he's dumping his motorhome sewage. Yeah, sewage just in the wherever. I don't know how it works because I've never had a motorhome. But I think you're supposed to only put it in certain places. And I think he's just dumping it in any old drain. And I all drains lead to the ocean. So that's not good. Thanks, Pixar. But apparently they did a little comedy cartoon thing of the Phantom Dumper that Rish appreciated where it was the Grim Reaper emptying his sewage instead. So, uh, Well, the, the, I did read a, 
an article in the paper, and I'm surprised you guys haven't covered it extensively on your wonderful show. Uh, but uh, I believe what happened the first time was somebody heard some sound. They, they checked. They went to investigate, and they said, "What's that smell?" <laughs> And uh, the Grim Reaper was standing there, and he turned and said, It's Dookie. It's Count Dooku. <laughs> Why didn't we mention the Phantom Dumper? Because That's the all Phantom. Grim is the Grim Reaping <laughs> Phantom Dumper. That's why. L.W. Grim, the <laughs> Phantom Dumper. All right. And we're back. <laughs> So, we have other participants. Should we move on? No, not, no? not at this point. The, <laughs> the, the elf tour around New York is... That's funny, because right before we got to that part, where they had mentioned the Ferris Bueller tour, uh-huh. and then they were going to New York, I was just like, okay, well, is it like a Miracle on 34th Street tour? Could it be Home Alone lost in New York too. Yeah, it, just, it could have been since they were originally just stuck in the airport for a second maybe that's what it is they're just going to go stay in some you know under construction home but yeah I just tried to think of you know a, a Christmas classic that took place in New York and yeah Elf didn't immediately spring to mind yeah I'm, I have to admit I, I, we've never have we we've uh, we've got to have mentioned the whole deal breaker uh, episode idea which we never ran no yeah we've never done this episode but this has been an episode that Rish has wanted to do for a long time where the two of us make a list of deal breakers when it comes to films and then we just go through our list and talk about them and a deal breaker would be an actor or actress who if you find out they are in the movie, you're like, uh, I'm not going to go see that. Yeah. Originally, you could be like, whoa, this this looks good. And then starring. And you're like, oh, wow. It's a good thing I found that out before I showed up. Ugh. But yeah, unfortunately for me, Will Ferrell, he would probably make my list. I just don't find the guy funny in the least. I don't know what, you know, so many people do. He's one of the comedy legends of our time. And uh, all that makes me think is that our time sucks. <laughs> well, at least we've got Rob Schneider. I don't know that he's still making movies, but as long as he draws breath, there's still hope for cinematic comedy. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, do you, what are your thoughts on Rob Schneider? Um, he does say you can do it <laughs> in a bunch of shows, so that is pretty legendary. <laughs> Has he done anything else? <laughs> he he was, had a career there. He was the star of movies for a little while. Yeah, what was what were those movies where uh, he Deuce was Bigelow, Deuce Bigelow, Deuce Bigelow, he did two of those. That's it. He did two? Like I like Rob Schneider. Here and there there's He did there's, the hot chick <laughs> that introduced your girlfriend to the world. Here and there there's movies where they get sequels and you're like, "Why is there a sequel to this?" And then sometimes there's seven sequels to those movies, so you never know what's going on in the world. Uh, but yeah, I'm, a lot of people really love that movie, Elf. I don't, I don't, I guess that's all I need to say. <laughs> yeah, moving on. <laughs> well, I'd not, you know, not to bash your story, Nathan, because it was fine that these people liked Elf. I guess they were just those people. Who are you calling those people? <laughs> I'm wondering if I should cut any of this out. <laughs> okay, well, let's go on to the next selector. Select T participant, I think, was what Thank we were you. going with. What's that? That word. I yes, the next participation medal winner is Marshall. 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 Ba 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 ba. It's not butter. Marshall Latham. Wait. Speaking of Al Grimm, the late Marshall Latham managed to send us a story. I- yes. From beyond the grave, that's right. He, he sent us a tale. The Grim Reaper came down, <laughs> tapped him on the shoulder, and he went. <gasps> he took a break from dumping. To uh... he's got a premise for us. This is our first that isn't a full blown story. I'm kind of blown away, especially by Nathan Allgrim's story. And it was a full on story. He had edited it, edited it, story. read it, the whole thing. You know, I, I'm pretty impressed with the. Amazing amount of effort that we've seen so far. But then there's Marshall. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, though, why would he even bother knowing that we would cut it out of our show, that we would forget to air it? Right, exactly, yeah. Why? <laughs> when we're obviously not going to use it. Okay. Okay, so who's, who's after Marshall, then? Can, can we just run? <laughs> who's next? Then? Yeah, we'll skip on to... Uh... All right, Marshall, here's your thang. Let's see your thang, Marshall. The Christmas Dildo by Algar Van Kluth. Well, didn't you do a commercial for a Christmas Dildo that we ran on I show? vaguely remember it being like Hallmark Hall of Fame yeah. presents the Christmas Dildo. You had like, she never was happy. Or what? I don't remember how it went. <laughs> I wish I knew what episode that was so we could reprise it. Hey, Big and Rish, this is Marshall. I did want to contribute to your uh, Christmas box idea, broken mirror thing, whatever, for the Dune Steve. Uh, I wasn't able to actually write a story, so I don't know if this qualifies or not. Um, I did think about a story, and I did sit down with my family. I thought, oh, let's make this a family kind of thing. So I asked my kids and, and what they would think was in the box or in the gift and you know when did we receive it um you know what happened afterwards and that kind of thing and so it was kind of fun to sit down and talk about it as a family and come up with different things there was a whole bunch of different ideas um i think one of my kids wanted it to be a superhero suit or something like that and um my uh, one boy talked about an episode of The Haunting Hour or Goosebumps or something like that that he watched where uh, th- th- kind of the same premise where the family received a box under the tree that nobody knew where it came from and what was inside and they, they were going to wait till Christmas morning to open it but there was a like a creature in there that broke out and destroyed their Christmas tree and their house and and threatened them, and basically the thing was, uh, at the end of the thing, they were all trapped in the attic to get away from this creature that uh, was in their Christmas gift box, and it turns out it was actually Santa that gave them the box, because their family was falling apart, and they they needed to uh, get together and remember what made them a family kind of thing. So that was his pitch. He's like, I said, yeah, but that's, uh, that's already been done. So I don't know if we want to just rip that off or not. Uh, but I thought that was a, a pretty good, uh, solution to that, that I guess had already been done. Uh, ultimately we came up with, uh, more of a, a nicer story. It wasn't a horror story and it wasn't like an action adventure thing, which would have been cool. But uh, ultimately, you know, more of a family-related, heartfelt story. I don't know if it was heartfelt, but... So, it turns out that Grandma was visiting for Christmas, and she didn't bring the box either. It wasn't her box. Anyway, so they decided to open it on uh, Christmas Eve, I think, was when they discovered the box and they decided to open that box they didn't want to wait until the morning and when they opened it up they found a key and like a clue and so what ended up happening was they ended up going on a scavenger hunt uh, for what the, the true gift was in the box and so they went around different places in the house and there was kind of two two versions of the story going on. One of it was Grandma was visiting uh, the family where they lived. And another idea was that we all went to Grandma's house for Christmas. And she had a big house, you know, with attics and basements and, you know, just lots of rooms that weren't used anymore and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that might have won out <laughs> at the end that we were at Grandma's house and it was... We went on a scavenger hunt through Grandma's house. So I was trying to keep it. What would you, what would be your gift? If you could have a special gift that was just for you, you know, what would you want it to be? I was trying to keep it real in that sense, but it ended up being more, you know, more fictionalized or more 
not necessarily something that they wanted or whatever, but uh, what sounded good for a fiction story, which this is a fiction story, so that works out. Um, you know, I think one of them had like a magical flute that helped them in their music, or it was just something that, that they cherished. You know, even mom and dad uh, received um, a special gift. I think mine ended up being um, a letter from my dad that I had never read before, and or something like that. Um, just him saying what he he was proud of me, or this or that, that kind of thing. I should have written it all down. That was my intention was to write it down after we got done and to actually write the story out. But I, I haven't had a chance to do that. So, But that, that was the idea, that, the, that there was a key and a clue, and that led us to another place, and somebody got their special gift, and then we went on. That gave us another key and another clue, and we went to another place and found it. So anyway, that, that was what was in the box for us, for our family. And, uh, you know, that even that premise of a key and a clue and special gifts, I mean, that could go in a million different directions as well. Anyway, that that's the story that we came up with. And even though it's not written out in detail, I thought I'd at least share it with you so that uh, you could include it in your list of ideas or um, as a contribution to your Christmas story event. I enjoy the podcast. Keep it up. And we'll talk to you later. Thanks, guys. You know what? On second thought, let's skip Marshall's. He, he's used to it. We don't really need to play it. <laughs> All right. So that was Marshall's ankle cast esque uh, idea for uh, this story. It's a scavenger hunt, it's, it's a Hallmark Hall of Fame type story you don't get a lot of flutes and boxes though uh in hallmark hall of fame <laughs> you don't find a lot of people sticking flutes in the boxes well i mean i would watch more yeah if... you'd be more of a fan of that uh, network yeah you know i wish that he had managed to write it down um, you know marshall is a writer and the scavenger hunt thing is is I like the idea, especially of each person getting a present, you know, something that... Did you get an idea or something supernatural going on here, too? It's like each person like, gets something... Well, there couldn't... was a magic flute or something like that. It wasn't just a regular one. It was like one that <laughs> hypnotized children and made them, you know, dance away from their parents and follow the piper off into the... No? That wasn't the flute? Nine pipers piping. Oh, no... Is that what was coming after the Eight Maids of Milk King? I don't know. Oh, I, I don't know the song. It was just going to get worse and worse. Ten lords a-leaping. Oh. It did, it did seem like maybe there was some kind of supernatural thing. You know, I like that kind of an idea, too. You know, similar to, since we just mentioned it, the uh, 12 Days of Christmas leaving something on someone's doorstep kind of an idea. The, the story that I told earlier, that's... The scavenger hunt thing is another thing that we do, although in our family it has evolved to be what the Easter Bunny brings. Easter Bunny brings just three little, well, four little eggs now. <laughs> and inside each one is a clue that takes you to uh, another egg and then another egg and then another egg until you finally get to the end where you find your entire Easter basket stuffed with all the crap that it comes with. You know what bothers me about Easter, though, is... Uh all the movies people don't believe in the Easter Bunny, even though, <laughs> even though he obviously brings those eggs. Sorry, I'm trying to think. There are not a lot of Easter Bunny movies. I, yeah, I, I think the Rankin Bass folks did one or two of like Peter Cottontail and here like, comes Peter Cottontail, and maybe another one about the Easter Bunny himself. Like I can't remember what it would be called, but yeah, I think they tried. Rankin Bass did one for like the New Year's baby, and that's true. I remember probably yeah. one for I don't know. Oh, there was a movie a few years <laughs> back called Hop. Oh, that right, was a CG. Right. I'm sure it was very amusing with talking animals <laughs> and Easter centric about the Easter yeah, Bunny. There was that. and there was 
Legends of the Guardians or something like yeah, that. Yeah, where it's like Easter Jack Bunny. Frost and the Easter Bunny and the Phantom Dumper and like <laughs> Cupid or something like that. They're just like things from different holidays. Right. I think Rankin Bass did a, a Halloween show too where it was all those claymation things with like the, the Pumpkin King in it and they did like a bunch of songs. It was a weird like thing where like they had Halloween and then like also Christmas kind of mixed in. The Boogeyman was in it. Doesn't sound familiar? No, 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 it doesn't. Oh. Not at all. Okay. Positively sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> and probably. so close before Christmas. Yeah, I probably was. I try not to have nightmares. Finding parking is nightmare enough. Yeah, seriously. Okay, so I don't know how we got way off on yeah, the sorry about that. No, no, no. Thing, but, uh, Marshall was talking, well... Just the the it idea was my fault, of I think the the treasure hunt the the scavenger hunt. That's right. You have transferred it from your family holiday tradition to an Easter. Yeah, that's what tradition. we do at Easter for all the uh, the kids. And yeah, it's funny because as my kids get older, I've, I'm thinking, okay, I got to make it harder. And so <laughs> I try to make it hard. All it does is make it harder on me. Unfortunately, mm. <laughs> my wife's just like, "That's your thing. Go and do it." But I thought it would be fun, especially now that my son has his driver's license, to make him have to, like, drive around town to find all of his eggs. That would be so awesome, don't you think? You go to, like, four places and you give each one of them the, my son's going to come here, and you get, you know. Yeah. You get to make go fun of Go to the gas and- station. <laughs> my son's going to be in here looking for an Easter egg, all right? It'd be so great for him to open up the one clue and be like, what the crap? Yeah. This is a picture of the gas station. <laughs> You tell the girl there, hey, would you mind putting on, like, something sexy? It's probably the last time we're going to do this with him. I just want it to be special. i got to ask, not to go back to the fudge and Easter thing, but i got to ask, when does it stop? At some point, you have to say, the line must be drawn here. <laughs> Surely your kids don't think the Easter... No, no, of course not. No, they're, they're way past that, but that doesn't mean you got to stop doing interesting things. Be like, okay, well, now you know, so this holiday we're not doing it anymore so you're just going to continue to buy them easter stuff scavenger hunt things put stuff in a basket for them i think i don't know okay well it just sounds like like it's more work than than it is fun anymore and so well it is and it isn't i love to do it with them and watch them try and get it but yeah i I don't know i mean i'm serious like telling you about this really makes me want to do the thing where he has to drive around this year now all right (laughs) motivates me although that yeah the problem is setting it up would be a lot of work anyways oh we need to take a commercial well we got a commercial break we've got a sponsor yeah it's nice to have a sponsor please donate to the show anyway but you know hey cool it's a sponsor let's let's check it out hey there this is big anklevich speaking on behalf of rish benjamin outfield Are you a fan of Rish's disgusting stories, home runs, the awful tale of the Minnesota diarrhea ghost, and space shit? Well, you're in luck, because now you can buy a collection of all of Rish's most poop-centric stories in one volume. It's Never Trust a Fart, the scatological stories of Rish Outfield, now available for purchase. Yes, you can get them all here. The Brown Prom, Enter the Dung Beetle, The House of Ideas, a.k.a. The Toilet Stall of Destiny, The Crappening. Award-winning author Matthew Wayne Selznick craps himself in the school cafeteria. The Highest Dung on the Ladder, Shite of the Living Dead. The Day a Bus Station Restroom Attendant Demanded a Dollar for a Few Sheets of Toilet Paper. Nonfiction. Montezuma's Revenge, The Tainted Scallops Incident, The First Rule of Shite Club, The Longest Bowel Movement Ever, Space Shit, The Next Generation, Writer and Podcaster Matthew Wayne Selznick soils himself on his wedding day, But Crack to the Future, Pootopia, The Mystery of the Orange Brown Stain. Novelist Matthew Wayne Selznick defiles himself at the funeral of his mother. The Bung and the Restless. And Shite of the Navigator. All that for one low price. Find this multi-award losing collection at Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, 
Goodreads, and SmashTurds.com. Also thrown in will be Matthew Wayne Sells, and it gets caught in his zipper in the fitting room of a J.C. Penney's. Which is not technically scatological, but it's still part of the famed Selznick Adventure series, and hence is included. Or order today directly from the Doonstief website, and we'll throw in a bonus collection. A very small pine box. The stories of B.D. Anklevich, where little children die. Buy it today. Okay, so there's our commercial. Order now. Yeah, don't miss out on the wonderful scatological stories. Hey, that was your idea, man. You said I needed to share my scatological stories. Yeah, especially considering that it's 90% of them. <sighs> my favorite is Shite of the Navigator. Oh, that was a good one. Oh, you know. It was much more uh, heartwarming than the original movie. Seat warming as well. <laughs> yes. Never trust that fart. Uh, okay, so next on our participation award give out, handout, uh, is? Is. Okay, so there's this listener of the show. His name is John Hyam, right? Yeah, sure. And for the longest time, I was sure his name would be pronounced Higgum. Well, because it's spelled Higgum. Because it's spelled Higham. yeah, H I G H A M, which I guess could be high um because you know the word high is spelled that way. But I f- never would have guessed that. So our next participant is Michael O. Hey, G H can be said several different ways. Like you know, if it ends like enough. Ends with a G-H. Okay. Bow ends with a G-H. You know, a branch of a tree is a, is a bow. Ghastly starts with a G-H. The, it does start with a G. I was going more for the in the middle or end of a word kind of a thing. Oh, okay. But, well, okay. but I guess you could say it with, with a hard G. Sometimes it has, uh, I want to say that, that one chick who was like a dancer, her name was Julianne Huff, and I'm pretty sure... That was H O U G. Oh, okay. Or the or easier, the word rough. That ends with a G H. So there's lots of different ways you can say. G- uh, and so this guy's. So spell it for me. O apostrophe H A E G H E R. So it could be it could be Huffer <laughs> or Hafer. H A Hager probably Hager. I think Hager. Okay. Because, H- H- yeah, H-A-E. Like, how do you even pronounce an A-E? That's another. Mm. Oh, Hafer. Hager. 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 I like Hager. Hager sounds. Hager sounds like a name. Like, it's probably it. Because, yeah. like, those shirts are, like, called Hager. Oh, Like, okay. the dress shirts. Hauer. Could be Hauer. Maybe, or Hay- Hayer. Like, Rudger Hauer. Yeah, okay. I don't know why it would be an O sound, but the you know, like bow is ends with a GH, so hey we're hey I don't know. We're gonna say Hager. Michael O'Hager. Okay, Michael O'Hager. <laughs> Hager. Oh, Hager. That's Hager. one of those things. Hager. How's that? I, you say I, Hager, I say Hager. You know, I wish he the whole thing. I wish he'd given us some kind of pronunciation so that we wouldn't have gone well, through all this. Well, he couldn't have known. It's, it's, to him, it's probably it's like well, yeah, Hager. It should be Hager, obviously right. right. Yeah, it's I'm sure. Hager, I, I, you like, would never. It, it's Hager, always that Hager, way. Hagar. You know. <laughs> Anyways, here is his story. Hagar I think it's, the horrible. I believe it's called Christmas Spirit. Oh, okay. So here we go. Christmas Spirit mm. by Michael O'Hare. Wait, hold oh, the freaking what? Michael O'Hare? Well, why didn't he spell it Michael O'Hare then? I, why? Yeah, why all these extra letters? That's just mean. <laughs> I guess we should have listened to this before. That would have been wise because then we could have skipped all that stuff. <sighs> okay. Well, we got to fill the two hours somehow. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, Christmas Spirit by Michael O'Hare. Back to the back to the beat, y'all. Y'all. Christmas Spirit. By Michael O'Hare. No one knew who the present was from. Nothing was written on the box. It had been a hard winter for the family, with John losing his job, and them barely having any money for presents. So surprise interrupted the somber mood when they saw the brightly wrapped package under the tree. 
It had no labeling, except a note attached that said, Something to make your holiday brighter. They opened the package to see a rectangular bottle of amber liquid. John suspected that it was whiskey, and thought perhaps a friend of his, who knew his love for whiskey, snuck it in as a surprise, perhaps so he could drown his troubles. But when he opened the bottle, it did not have the familiar grain tang. He poured a glass, and it had a strange melodic tinkle when it was poured. He drank, and rather than the alcohol burn, it had a smooth, sweet taste. He closed his eyes and immediately was reminded of past Christmases, and the joys that his family felt, singing carols and playing board games. A simpler time, when it was less about presents and more about the togetherness. He pulled out several more glasses from the bar, and poured a glass for each of the family members. They each experienced a different flavor, and were also reminded of happy memories. Each of them finished their glasses with a smile on their faces. And then John noticed something on the bottle that he had not seen at first. Etched into the glass were the words, Christmas Spirit. And thus it was that his family was filled with Christmas Spirit. Aha, I get it. Because alcohol is sometimes referred to as spirits. Okay. Yeah, so this was the Christmas Spirit. Ah, plural, Christmas spirits. Ah, okay. Well, it was called, I think it was just called the Christmas spirit, but... I think I get it. Yeah. But it, it, it's bringing back a Christmas memory to me. Yeah? Tell and me the more. Christmas memory is when we lost the spirit of Christmas by breaking uh, the Christmas <laughs> plate that said the spirit of Christmas, which your wife still insists on putting up there, although yeah, she, now she complains about it. She oh, no, she complains about Believe. Yeah, she doesn't like the Believe blocks anymore because no one... Now, it's not just me. It's everyone in the family that rearranges them on her. I love that so much. <laughs> that is endlessly entertaining. Whereas a plate that says the spirit of Christmas, yeah, not so much. That's pretty much what it is. It's a plate that says the spirit of Christmas. Yeah, it was fun, that story about breaking it. Yeah, it still persists. Which is good. Vaguely, I remember you asking her if you could break it for the <laughs> the episode. And, and, she and she said, tried to break mm, mm, mm. forgot to say the magic word. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she said that. It does go hand in hand with that story, although uh, this is much more heartwarming than yeah, our story yeah. ever pretended to be. In the end, the best thing that they got was Blink-182's Happy, Happy Holidays, Holidays, You, you Bastard, Bastard yes. as, uh, on the Christmas radio station. But hey, that would brighten my Christmas Eve to hear that song. <laughs> but it's only partially a Christmas song because half of it is about Labor Day. <laughs> well, we don't have enough Labor Day carols. Yeah. I, I, it's, it serves two purposes. Yeah, there you go. So that was Michael O'Hare's story. Well, thank you, Michael. Oh, yeah, sorry. Hair. Sorry about the old name thing. Hopefully you don't hate us forever. Just till this time next year. <laughs> yeah, that's that one is sweet and nice. I, uh, I'm i not disappointed. I'm happy that... I mean, it is the holidays and all that. You're not going to get a lot of Krampus type stuff. But I am surprised that people that so few people took it in a horror direction. Because the premise lent itself so much to... No one knew who the present was kill, from. Kill, kill, kill. Nothing was written on the box. Monkey paws. <laughs> Jeez. <Gross. laughs> the Christmas spirits in here yeah. was just, ugh. Christmas spirit just left this room. <laughs> okay, our next uh, participant <laughs> in uh, today's extravaganza is Bria Burton. Bria. Oh, it's Bria? Oh, crap. No, look how Are it's you spelled. kidding me? This whole time? This is so much worse than the O'Hare thing now. I've been calling her Br Bria for years on the show and, and, you know, just, I guess, in my head is the only other time because she doesn't live nearby, so I don't like hang out. But, oh, it's Bria? No. You bastard. 
So Bria is our only female listener, I've been told. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Well, no, the rest of them all uh, hate quit the show. What do they call it? Rage, rage quit. We rage yeah. quit the show when we talked about cats. <laughs> <laughs> no, women and men quit the show when we talked about cats. Well, let's hear what Bria has to Bria has to say. Okay. The Smallest Gift by Bria Burton The smells of cinnamon and spice were not nice. The empty plate with a few leftover crumbs on a nearby end table tempted me to reach out from where I sat on the carpet and sample the cookies that I hadn't been allowed to eat. But I knew better. Outside, the snow fell in light, graceful flakes, making a thin layer on the ground. Inside, and only a few feet away from me, the brothers tore apart their gifts like lions tearing up that poor gazelle on the television. I didn't like to think of the two terrors as my brothers. They were just the brothers that I was unfortunately forced to live with. I glanced at a small box under the Christmas tree that the brothers hadn't noticed. The bright red wrapping didn't match the rest of the coordinated colors. Eileen, my grandmother, had Raffaella wrap all the gifts. The paper Eileen had ordered matched the blues and browns in her favorite grandson's rooms, making this one little red box an anomaly. I guessed it was for me. I picked up the box, no heavier than a pad of sticky notes, wondering what Eileen would have gotten me. She didn't appreciate that I hadn't been born a boy like her other grandchildren, and insisted I call her Eileen instead of Grandma. My nine cousins, all boys, made her very proud. Two of her sons had done their duty, while my father had failed with me. Three years ago, he and my mother died in a car accident, which Eileen said served them right. The brothers and I came to live with Eileen, and my constant daydream was somehow getting away from here. But I was too much of a coward to run away. Raffaella, the housekeeper, and I cleaned all three stories of Eileen's house, which I was not to refer to as my house, every week. Raffaella was the only person whom I believed truly loved me now that mother and father were gone. Which made the gift especially odd. Eileen never got me anything for Christmas except the meal that we all shared that I should be very grateful for, she always reminded me. The brothers had 12 presents each, all large packages filled with toys that they were already breaking. Raffaella scrambled to pick up after the boys, shoving the ripped wrapping paper into a garbage sack before Eileen could complain about the mess. I absentmindedly began pulling at the ribbon on the red box. A hand slapped my face. The shock only delayed the stinging for a moment. I dropped the box, both hands covering the welt that must be forming on my hot cheek. It wasn't the first time Eileen hit me in the face. There were bruises I covered up on my arms and legs, too. The brothers had the freedom to smack me whenever they felt like it, with no consequences. Eileen stepped in front of me, pointing at the ground. What is that? Her tight lips and narrow gaze frowned down at me with such hatred that I couldn't understand how we could be related. I thought my words broke off, realizing how stupid I had been to think any of the presents would be for me. What is wrong? asked Raffaella, coming over to kneel beside me. Her cold hand touched my cheek, making it feel a little better. Her warm brown eyes saddened as she looked at me. Even if she didn't love me, she at least felt sorry for me. I did not order any red wrapping paper, so what is that little thing, Raffaella? I never saw it before. One of the brothers picked up the dropped box and examined it. It's too small to be one of my presents. It must be for you. He threw it at his brother, and it bounced gently off his chest. Hey, I don't want a stupid little box. It feels empty. He chucked it at Raffaella, who ducked as it flew over her head and landed on the couch. Eileen marched over and picked it up. There's no name on it. How did it get under the tree, Raffaella? Perhaps Santa Claus, she offered. 
The brothers laughed, snorting. <laughs> Eileen groaned. Oh, you know we don't pretend to play along with all that nonsense in this house. No Santa Claus here. Eileen broke the news the minute we moved in three years ago, which happened to be on Christmas Eve. I had cried all night. Fine, I'll open it and see who deserves whatever it is. Eileen's long fingernails sliced into the wrapping. She pushed the red paper off and it floated to the floor. Rafaela immediately scooped it up and placed it in the trash bag. The brothers ran up beside Eileen, hovering like the hyenas that now mauled some poor creature on TV. The box beneath the red wrapping paper was gold and shiny. Oh, Eileen sneered. I guess she didn't know how to smile. This would make a nice decoration at least. What's inside? The brothers pawed at Eileen, who patted both of their heads. Patience. I sat on the floor only half curious, my cheeks still hot and my eyes now stinging with tears. I was so tired of crying on Christmas that I felt stupid for letting Eileen and the brothers get to me again. Raffaella took my hand. Come. She gently tugged and I rose from the carpet and followed her toward the kitchen. In the doorway, she turned and held up her finger for me to be quiet. I tilted my head at her, unsure why she wanted my silence, since I wasn't saying anything anyway. Not a word. Promise? Confused, I nodded. She flicked her gaze back toward where Eileen and the brothers were now seated together on the couch. Eileen's slender fingers lifted the lid to the gold container. A rush of wind escaped from the box. Raffaella's hand covered my mouth before I had time to exclaim with all the others. Whoa! The brothers cried, thrown back into the couch cushions. Eileen's hair, a tight updo, splayed about her face in the wind, her mouth forced apart. She looked like she was trying to scream, but no words came out. Raffaella wrapped me up in a hug, but I didn't struggle, watching in awe. The tendrils of wind formed into red lines, giving shape to the gusts bursting into and around Eileen and the brothers. They were tossed into each other, but the wind seemed to contain them, like they were in a tiny red tornado. One by one, the brothers lifted into the air, gaining speed and circling above the gold box, still in Eileen's hands. They spun with the red lines faster and faster until they blurred into lines of their own. Finally, Eileen's shriek could be heard as she lifted from her seat on the couch into the air. Her feet raised until they were over her head. I had no idea how her scrawny arms could manage a handstand on the floating gold box. Her spinning began slowly. She turned in circles just like the brothers had, her form streaking into the red lines the faster she went until she melded into the funnel of wind. The Christmas tree swayed and a few ornaments bounced off onto the carpet. The porcelain snowman on the floor near the couch tipped over and broke into pieces. I was half aware of a few gusts brushing my face and hair. All the while, Raffaella held me tight and I prayed she wouldn't let go. I couldn't see Eileen or the brothers anymore. They were just lines now spinning in the red tornado. Then I heard a sucking sound like a drain lapping up water. The box descended toward the floor and the red lines poured back inside. The red tornado shrank into the container and the lid hopped off the couch, securing itself back on the box. Everything stilled and went silent. The damage left behind was minor, just the broken snowman and a few downed ornaments. Raffaella removed her hand from my mouth. I stared, overwhelmed and happy. What was that? I spun around. I explain later. Let's get your things. You're leaving this horrible place for good. Raffaella's smile told me it was true. The few things I had didn't take long to gather and filled only one small rolling suitcase. I timidly walked out the front door while Raffaella carried the gold box. I half expected Eileen to come running up behind us to drag me back inside. What happened to them? It's better if you don't know, okay? I nodded quickly, used to obedience without question. Where will I go? You're coming to live with me. Like the slap to the face, I was shocked. But this was the good kind of shock, and that wasn't something I knew how to handle. 
I burst into tears, dropping my rolling suitcase. It fell into the yard, now coated with an inch of snow. Come here, Miha. Rafaela hugged me tight, her heavy coat making her feel puffy and warm. I squeezed her as hard as I could, so grateful. Thank you. Suffice it to say, she whispered, there may not be a Santa Claus, but you do have a fairy godmother. The end. All right, so there's uh, Bria's story, Brian. fully produced, like not with a full-on full cast, fully full, uh, full produced. Sorry, I realized that I was saying full a few too many times, and but yeah, that was cool. All the sound effects, one of them scared the crap out of me. I have to admit, Is it the snowman shattered. <laughs> yeah, well, the snowman shattered. Weirdly, I was trying to fart right in the middle of the story, and that was when they opened up the box and the wind started blowing. That was cool, because it completely masked that. Nobody knows who did it. Hey, that was really solid. I was worried at the very beginning that it was going to be another dead parent story. <laughs> and it was, but a fairy tale kind of thing. And uh, Yeah, it almost <laughs> felt like the start of a YA novel. Oh, really? A, you know, it could have been some kind of Harry Potter-esque story. Her parents died and it served them right for having a girl? Is that, is that what I... that's what I got out of it. Yeah, for some reason she loved the... And, and I kind of felt bad for the little brothers. I mean, I'm sure they were little bastards or whatever because they were spoiled or something. But did they... I don't know what happened to these people where they went. <laughs> They just got burned in hell. Yeah, it was better off that we don't know where they went. But yeah, I, I don't know. A child that's kind of a piece of crap. Often it's not. It's not really the child's fault. I guess there is some nature and some nurture involved in it. But uh, yeah, they were allowed to hit her whenever they wanted. Yeah, but little kids always hit each other if they're allowed to. You know what I'm saying? Like. They were told to do these kind of things. Usually you're supposed to teach your kids not to. So I, I felt like those kids should have somehow been rehabilitated. I don't know. Maybe I'm, that's where they went. They went down to purgatory, not to hell. Uh, I, I, and, I was going to say, I'm glad they got sent to North Korea. I just They're working out their sins right now. And maybe they'll come back out the box and finish out their life later. Yeah, I guess there was sort of a Harry Potter vibe. I was thinking more of a Cinderella. Right, because it was a fairy godmother. But uh, where it goes from, you know, it felt felt like maybe the first chapter of a story. I mean, you know, those YA novels aren't necessarily exactly Harry Potter ripoffs. I mean, most of them are, but not all of them. Um, You know, maybe she would go off to a magic school or a fairy godmother school or a... Well, it could just be some fairy kingdom. No, it has to be a school. Oh. Maybe a princess academy. Okay, well, uh, I've heard that those are... Good. Yeah. I wonder if Bria has, a, sorry, Bria, has any interest in continuing the story from there or, you know, if any clue as to where it might have gone if she chose to continue it or if that's just the door is closed and it's like, no, that's where the story ends. I, if, I sometimes wonder with people with their stories. or If this is an Ian syndrome story or not. No, no. I, I wasn't thinking that. A lot of people have talked about that in broken mirror stories in the past where they're like oh yeah i'm totally going to expand this story into something now it's almost like our little suggestion is something that got their juices flowing just enough and then once they really got flowing after writing the story now they're like okay no i got i got something from this how many of them actually do that i don't know but a lot of them talk as though yeah yeah this could really go places and i think sometimes getting feedback from listeners really helps to make you see oh yeah this is something that really has legs yeah definitely i know better than most somebody expanded their broken mirror story to like a novella or novel length didn't they i don't know if i've ever heard that it actually was achieved i know people who said they wanted to do that but uh, i don't know if we've ever heard back Maybe you heard back and I just wasn't listening. I had my hands over my ears going, la, 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 I don't care, la, 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 la. Okay. Some, something People like that. People do do that. Know. And then they get sent into the Christmas box. Yes. 
I wouldn't want that. Uh, we've got uh, one final recording here. Came in just under the wire. Okay, so Aspiration Realized is uh, who sent this in. This is a member of our forum, the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine Forum. He uh, posts under this name. His real name is not mentioned here, so I'm just not going to mention it, just in case. Maybe he wants to be incognito. Maybe he's a secret Santa. Yeah, that, I think that's <laughs> what his unrealized aspiration is. Yes. yes. Okay. All right, so uh, here it is. Hey guys, this will be just a treatment or a synopsis, not a full story. The deadline snuck up on me. I know some of the Dune fans are really going to knock it out of the park, though, so I'm interested to see what you guys come up with. Anyway, my take on the prompt begins in a similar setup to Jingle All the Way, with the father desperately searching for that one action figure in particular that every boy wants this season. We'll call him Jim. Of course, the toy is sold out, as Jim is a procrastinator and waited until a week before Xmas to try and buy one. The holidays are stressful in general for Jim, and his wife is particularly unhappy when he confesses he didn't start shopping in time to find the toy at the top of Jim Jr.'s wish list. But a few days before Xmas, Jim Jr. discovers a present in his room. The boy grabs it and dashes to the living room and announces that he has an early present from Santa. Jim Jr.'s mother takes the present to check who it's from, exchanging glances with Jim. Finding no tag on the box, she says it must really be from Santa, and winks at her husband. Their son rips the present open, and of course it is the action figure Jim couldn't find earlier that week. Jim Jr. shrieks with excitement and dashes back to his room. Jim is wondering how his wife managed to find one, but before you can ask, she says, a little early for presents, isn't it? Jim is confused. You mean you didn't buy it? And she gives him a playful shove. Whatever you say, Santa. She leads him to his thoughts, flashing him the first smile he's received from her since he came home empty-handed. Jim checks the remnants of the package Jim Jr.'s toy came in, finding no identifying marks. The wrapping paper features a repeating pattern of Santa's holding a finger to their lips in a shushing motion. So that's the setup. From there on, every day before Xmas, another package arrives, always without a name, always with that same wrapping paper. Jim starts to lose sleep over who is sending the gifts, accepting the praise for them, but consumed with jealousy at Santa's superior gift-giving. The exhaustion from lack of sleep only increases his paranoia. The next day, the wife gets a new purse she had mentioned wanting, despite it not being reasonable for their holiday budget this year. Jim tries to do a stakeout that night to catch whoever is leaving the gifts, but passes out shortly after midnight. The next day, he finds no presents, but gets a phone call from his brother who lives across town. His brother had been having issues with depression, and with the suicide rate climbing over the holidays, Jim had been worried about him. But over the phone, Jim's brother thanks him for the asshat magic spider crochet, and said that Jim was the only one who truly understood him. I was also going to have Jim's father, who he hasn't spoken to in years, come over on Christmas Eve holding a package, the same wrapping paper as before, and without a name. The gift was a model car of one of the classic Chevys they worked on when Jim was a kid. As they embrace, and Jim's wife invites his father to stay over for Christmas dinner, a chill still runs up Jim's spine. He doesn't know who's sending the gifts. The ending is the part I had the most trouble with. I knew that Jim himself should get the final gift, but I wasn't happy with my initial thoughts on what it was. I thought of coal or a gun to shoot himself with, but finally I decided on an idea that I liked. The final gift would be a Santa hat and a fake beard, with a picture of Jim wearing it, and a note explaining that Jim has led a double life, normal everyday Joe by day and secret Santa by night. It's like the Fight Club holiday special. Anyway, that's my take. I hope it isn't so obvious that I'm just repeating some other ideas that you guys are presenting. Before I cut off this recording, I just wanted to mention the idea of a Dune Steve Patreon again. After having it read during the Not the Bee episode and hearing Rish and Bing's reaction, I decided to do a little mock-up in the forums. You can find it in the Tangent section, appropriate since perhaps this recording will cause a tangent. I'm sure the Doonstief guys can come up with better ideas, but I'm hoping my thread can spark some interest among the other Doonstief fans, so please take a moment and check it out. Okay, so a little plug for the forum. Go check out the forum, everybody. I think our forum gets less traffic than it might need <laughs> sure i was gonna say then it should but i don't know that it should get traffic it just needs it so that one was a, a more of a treatment than a, a story although at points it felt like you know you were even saying as as we were listening to it why does he just put it in past tense and now it's a story because there was a fair amount of detail to it 
I thought it was funny the look that you made when he says maybe a gun to shoot himself <laughs> with. Just another person too inspired by Big Anklevich. Well, it just I didn't expect that. And, and this one was cheery. I mean, they all are. It's rare to get a Big Anklevich Christmas story. It tends to be the season when people are their minds turn toward hope and bright lights and peace on earth and all that stuff. And yeah, I think that this one had plenty of potential to be a really solid story. I mean, if if I were him, I would write it, write it down. And and if there are parts where you feel they're too derivative of like Jingle All the Way or whatever, you know, just make sure those parts, you work on those parts so they stand out a little more. So it's not a, I can't remember what the doll, the action figure was in Jingle All the Way. All I remember is how awful... Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was? Well, yes, he was really bad. And Jake Lloyd kid, was? Jake Lloyd, wow. But I think Jingle All the Way is the movie where Put the Cookie Down comes from. <laughs> Get to the chopper! <laughs> yeah, you can probably, you know, work some of that out just by, you know, you, you tell something just twisted enough so that it's your own thing. And, you know, it's not like Jingle All the Way is the first story that ever thought to, you know, play up the idea of that toy that you can't get your hands on. I'm sure there are others out there. Sadly, that may be the most famous of them, but Barbie talks about uh, there not being enough Buzz Lightyear toys to meet demand in Toy Story 2, so, you know, it was a thing. Well, yeah, and, and every year there is something like that. Yeah, like a um, Hatchimal. Isn't it Hatchimal? Is that what they're called? I would say that Hatchimals are this year's Tickle Me Elmo or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, the Hatchimal thing. I mean, it's just ridiculous how hard those are to find. I mean, it's, it's not like... Cabbage Patch Kids? Well, I, I, we were young when that Cabbage Patch thing happened, and because I wasn't a girl, I... I watched it with a little bit of just, you know, skepticism or whatever. But I have no idea how difficult the Cabbage Patch Kids actually were to get. So um, maybe I should talk about Furbies. But like stuff. the fucking Hatchimals on Black Friday, the local Walmart got six of them. They got six <laughs> on the busiest shopping day of the year. And when I heard that, I felt a little bit a little bit ashamed that I had taken four of them, but you know, it just, I, I just a little bit. My uh, sense of decency is atrophied yeah. to the point. Where... The worst part is that you've got them all up on your windowsill like that. It's all the kids keep walking by, looking at them, going, "I wish I had a Hatchimal or four. I'm a bad person. <laughs> but the part where he says it's like Christmas Fight Club, that. I didn't see coming. I'm sure you didn't see coming. And if you wrote that as a story, yeah, the, the thought that by night he goes out and gets these perfect presents or whatever, does the stuff that you can never... <laughs> Breaks into the store and steals the present he couldn't find. No, it just, but that, that idea of, you know, because I, I can see that scene writing itself. You know, there's only one left of this doll or toy or whatever that the kid wants. And so he's, he hides it. He stashes it someplace. And he's like, okay, so you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back when I have the money and I'm going to be able to buy this. And I'll know that it's there. And then he comes and somebody else has already gotten it. But he doesn't realize that he is the one that already got it. You know, and all that stuff. And he's like, oh, yeah, my wife had asked for this thing, but I had forgotten. But his subconscious hadn't forgotten. I don't know. I, I, I think that there is potential for a really solid story in there. Yeah, I think when he comes back to get that doll, there needs to be some zany Christmas music, like kind of... Dun, 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 and he runs through the store, and maybe there's somebody else that he's competing with, and he knocks a bunch of things down off of shelves uh, with no regard to the poor people that are going to have to pick those things up later. Maybe he, like... Hits that ball. You know the little cage that they always have those balls in? And he hits it and they just explode and fly everywhere. And like maybe an old guy with like a cane like steps on one and goes, whoa! Breaks his and hip. And flies in the air and yeah, breaks his hip and grrr, screaming on the ground. Never walks again. Yeah. Uh, some that some comedy. Yeah, classic. you need a lot of really good destructive uh, stuff in a, in a movie like that. I think that's why Jingle All the Way did so well. I think Turner Classic Movies shows it for 24 hours every Christmas Eve. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons why they filed for bankruptcy last week. 
<sighs> Anyways. Anyway, yes, I encourage him to write it. Otherwise, you know, I'll just steal it. And, and yeah, it you wouldn't want that. The other thing was uh, there was an asshat magic spider <laughs> embroidery thing or whatever. It's like, and that's another reason you need to write this friggin' story because that's delightful to somebody else other than you would want one of those. <laughs> yeah, I believe that was a prize that we gave away on the show once years ago. Maybe Aspiration Realized was the one who got it. And that's why he actually remembers it. Anything else we want to say? Oh, what's in the box? I don't know. Uh, thanks to everybody for participating. This was really cool. I was super impressed by all the effort that everybody put into all these stories. It was uh, way more than I expected. Um, well, yeah, it wasn't part of the rules. They didn't have to go all out if they didn't want to. Yeah. They certainly didn't have to put sound effects or music or, uh, you know, even if they had just sent us the raw file and I had to edit it, I wouldn't have complained about that. But, I, but everybody went above and beyond on this. I'm, I'm very impressed. Hopefully you all have really enjoyed that and wish that you had participated. And if so, maybe we'll do it again sometime. I, you know, I like this audience participation thing. When we did it with the last one, yeah, not the just, bees. Not the bees. Yeah, I just I, I was like, wow, hey, people helped make our show better and helped give us another episode, and that's always cool. It's like, I, I, and I, I think I've told you a million times, it's like one of those radio shows where it's like, well, okay, guys, we're just going to open it up to calls. What is your thought on uh, Asset Magic Spider? And then the listeners get to provide content for the next half hour or whatever, and all we have to do is just agree Chuckle or disagree. And go, and, yeah. <laughs> no way, man. It's like, well, thank you. Thank you very much. No, I, we did deserve that Parsec Award. You know, it's that kind of stuff. And so it's not exactly a radio show, but I got to experience a little bit of what that might be like. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for the Christmas gift. Yes. Thank you very much, folks, for for that. And, uh, yeah, we're actually going to be back with another episode. No. Before Christmas hits. And that episode will include the story that Rish and I wrote. Uh, not together. We wrote separate two stories. It will include the two stories that Rish and I wrote each. Each wrote. Tune in next time for the show. <laughs> yes, please. Please tune Thanks. In. Yeah, you'll find out where we went, if anywhere, with this premise. So, What's in the box? Once again, thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. And thank you for the many, many Christmas donations that yeah. have just come flooding in. Thanks, oh, wow. thanks you're, for you're all the so fish. generous. So long. <laughs> so long. Thanks for listening to The Dune Steef. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. Nathan All Grim. Not all. Nathan Most Grim. It's the first he's written since a high school creative writing class. Did you have a high school creative writing class? I did, but there was no writing that occurred in that class. It was just read the Scarlet Letter again. <laughs> like, what, again? I finished it 15 minutes ago. Well, everyone else finished it Wednesday. Start again. Well, I when, when I lived in L.A., at work, you know, I had one of those jobs. I had a real job for once in my life. What? And... They didn't require, but anybody want, who wanted to do Secret Santa, as they called it, could do it. And you'd draw somebody's name out of the hat. And we've talked about this before, but I've never talked about what happened the last year. And I, I, I think I, I remember telling you that, you know, my, my best friend was Jewish and he just didn't want to participate. And I was like, but it's not necessarily Christmas. I mean, I know it is, but it's like you could just try. Yeah, you, you could, could like... Just, the uh, Andrews sisters were all Jewish, and they still sang, like, the Santa Claus songs. They just didn't sing the religious ones. Anyhow, he uh, he did end <laughs> up doing it and uh, and thought that it was really cool to try and figure out who it was that was leaving the presents. And, and you know, did they know him or were they somebody that just vaguely knew him? Because yeah, you never knew who drew your, your uh, 
name out of a hat. And they didn't post like the list of employees that were doing it and weren't uh-huh. doing it. So you never knew. Uh-huh. But when mine happened, oh gosh, I, I feel embarrassed telling this on the air, but hey. Okay, so the first day uh, I come back to my desk or, you know, in the morning and there's a box of tissues on the desk. And I was like, oh, well, that's nice. That's 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 cool. You you know where this is going because I told you. I can it. guess. And <laughs> But tissues are, are... They're useful in they're, other ways than just the one don't, that I'm thinking don't of. Give, don't beat me to the punch. Come on. <laughs> but tissues are nondescript. It's like anybody could have gotten me that. And, you know, I, oh, okay. I have no idea what, who it was. But the next day, it was hand lotion. <laughs> and I was just like, hand lotion? Isn't that kind of a girly thing? It's just, geez, I don't know. What am I going to do with this bottle of Jergens? <laughs> <laughs> and then the third day, I got there. And <laughs> they had wrapped their present in newspaper this time. So I unwrapped it. And it was a Hustler magazine. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, whoa, whoa. And looking over my shoulder. Holy sh... Uh, this is going to go in the drawer here. <laughs> and the next day, it was like a penthouse <laughs> magazine. <laughs> anyway, my friend Kevin's wife had spent like $50 on porn. <laughs> <laughs> and every day there was another dirty magazine on my desk, you know, as a as a roundabout way of getting me fired. Oh, that's nice of her. <laughs> but of course you wouldn't have suspected a woman of yeah. doing this. But yeah, when it finally was revealed, she's like, so did you use it all? <laughs> like, I'm yes, the... I blew my nose several times. And, I have allergies, seasonal allergies. And uh, yeah, my, my, sometimes my Psoriasis. hands get dry, so them. I need a lot of lotion, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, I have not told that story before, but <laughs> can you imagine why I wouldn't tell that story? <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I, I thought about that and I was just like, I guess I could have gotten fired over that. But huh. you, you would have got fired over something yes, sooner or later. You anyway, know me very, so. very well. Josh Roseman lives in Georgia, engages in. Oh. Hey, that'll make you go blind. I mean, I'm not one to talk. Just but. hold on. To, he engages in Pogonatrophy. I'm not sure how you say that. I'm going to have to look it up now. I'm sorry. Well, how else could you say it? I don't know. It's a weird word. You could say it lots of ways. I've never seen it before. Paganotrophy? Okay. I mean, you know. Oh, he's a (laughs) paganotrophist, in other words. Cultivating and growing and grooming a mustache, beard, sideburns, or other facial hair. Why would Uh, you need a fancy name for that? Because they have fancy names for everything. Me. Where's dictionary.com? You teach, teach me nothing. nothing. Well, let's see if Miriam Webster has pronunciations. Miriam, will you help me with Webster, please? They don't have pronunciations. Audio. Oh, wait. No, that's Jubilee. I don't need pronunciation of Jubilee. So I look up Pagana Trophy. Uh-huh. And it says, did you mean gentrify? What? <laughs> and gave me no definition whatsoever. I want to know. Gentrify and Paganotrophy aren't even remotely close. <laughs> no, they're not. Trigonometry is closer than gentrify. <laughs> Paganotrophy. Pogo. Notrophy. Pogonotrophy. Pogonotrophy. Jeez. Pogonotrophy. We should just use that. <laughs> should I download that thing? <laughs> just say he practices. Pogonotrophy. You've already got it. It's saying it. Yeah, you could use it if you want from that. All right, let me get back to this. Josh Roseman. I better take that again. Josh. (laughs) Josh Roseman. Engages in pogonotrophy on a regular basis. Oh, dear God. Ew. And sometimes suffers from... God damn you. Why would we even read about the author on the list? Sphenopalpalatine ganglioneuralgia which I'm sure is another not worth knowing about thing pogonotrophy pogonotrophy ice cream headache brain freeze he engages in that? no he suffers from it sometimes he needs to be beaten pogonotrophy taint ganglioneuralgia ganglioneuralgia but what about sphenopalatine? Why? Sphenopalatine. Sphenopalatine ganglioneuralgia. Okay, I'll just say that. 
You just did. And sometimes suffers from sphenopalatine ganglioneuralgia. You know, we all do from time yeah, to time. Yeah, really, yeah, pretty Especially much. Especially when, you know, you haven't showered in a while. Okay. I'm not sure how that connects, but uh, I'm, I'm open to all types of people. I don't want to include any of that. Why, why, why would you include him about the author on this thing? That on okay, the show. You can skip it if you want. Fifty six, fifty four. Set your timer. Yeah. Set alarm for thirty four minutes from now. Let's see if it works. It's not been working very well recently. Ever since I upgraded it. Oh, there we go. Okay, we're good. Awesome. I've set an alarm for ten oh six p.m. That's neat. Watch this. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, you're perfectly welcome, sir. The, the sad thing about it is, it's not a true AI. Hey, it doesn't remember what you said before, you know, or what it's done before, or anything like that. Oh, yeah. I... So you say, you're well, thank you, and it'll say, you're, or if it does something wrong, you say, oh, you suck, and it'll have some response. But it's the same response anytime you say that, or, you know, it has like five responses that it rotates through, or whatever it's still pretty neat it's cool but i wish that you could actually build you know you can't give it a command and then like i don't know it's just Dude, yes you're digging not yourself in deeper if if it could remember what you'd say you'd leave your wife for it so that's <laughs> it's better that you it's just not a real ai it makes me sad Do you have... what is that sound train is that what it is Wow. How close is that train? You sure it's a train? It's just on the other side of the freeway. You sure it's not the end of the world? Well, that too. And I'm waiting for the big boom. Is that where that song went? I have no idea. They say that Michigan was gone, gone for good. That's remember misogynist. That song? Remember that song at all? No, it's a Jonathan Colton though. Yeah. Oh, so like a... Um, I forgot your name. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was going to ask you, as not as part of the show, we're we splitting this. We're going to do it as one massive episode. Uh, at some point, I'd also like to to cut to commercial, <laughs> and then we can talk about the commercial afterwards in That's the outtakes. Right, I'm supposed to read that commercial. Like the many, many, I, like when you mentioned the Phantom Dumper, I was like, why are you telling me? I know all about this. And then I realized, oh, this is a bit for the show. It's like, but aren't we going to cut all this out? <laughs> you can. I don't know. You can do what you want. That's what why you have the powerful edit stick. Well, I mean, things don't tend to get cut out forever. They get cut out till the end of the show. <laughs> right. I miss the days, though, when you would hide the outtakes on the the episode i just oh that was so much fun trying to find where they were and hearing about other people's cheaty methods where they would just highlight the whole post yeah, and that's then what all i ended up doing appear. i would always I'd be like oh there it is hey hey i don't have to look and then when i would hide it in plain sight and that didn't work and they're like i can't find them and it was just <laughs> yes. a link right there with all the other links yes that says for wendy <laughs> oh there's one we did that was just for wendy wendy's gone wendy's long gone no wendy's alive and well she just doesn't listen to our show anymore. I'm sure she does. Okay, that wasn't quite a sponsor. Perhaps <laughs> I should ask you about that. You showed a little hesitance and or reluctance to perform that. And I appreciate you doing it in the end. But uh, I thought it was only fair to ask if you had misgivings still. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I just find it hard to believe that Matthew Wayne Selznick will not hear about it eventually. And then be like, what the fuck? Do we have a, a commercial for a collection of your stories? Um, hopefully not. <laughs>